low energy availability. And probably the best example I can give from that is if we think about our ancestors and our evolutionary past and the nature of, of food and nutrition and how that's come to play out in terms of our energy availability across the day. So obviously we still have some hunter-gatherer hunter -gatherer societies left on earth and we can you know, have a look at, at how they behave and how they eat and, and their nutrition and that sort of thing. And it gives us some insight into maybe how most of us lived, you know, more than, you know, 10 or 20,000 years ago. And obviously these are times where food wasn't a nice, easy, scheduled breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It didn't work like that. You had to go out and find your food. You had to hunt for, for meat. You had to forage for, for plant-based foods or things like honey. And then you would have a certain amount of energy that you could then consume. And sometimes you would have a lot of energy to consume. And sometimes you would have very little energy to consume. And then depending on other factors like the weather, you could have droughts and famines and things like that, where you don't have adequate energy availability for potentially a prolonged period of time as well. So we know that humans are extremely adaptable to their environment. It's one of the reasons that we were able to, I guess, migrate to all corners of the earth where, you know, most plant and animal species have got kind of their defined habitats and they don't really venture beyond those all that much. So we know that, you know, the adaptability of humans has been an important part of that and the ability to adapt to a different environments. And one of those environments is an unpredictable energy intake, an unpredictable amount of calories in our diet. And so because of that, we've, we've got systems in place that sort of adapt to this. And that is that dimmer switch I talked about before. It's being able to turn down our energy expenditure slightly when there's a lack of food coming in relative to our caloric needs. Now, obviously, a lot of this is a little bit of speculation in terms of evolutionary biology. We can't you know, jump in a time machine and go back 20,000 years and measure what's happened. But you know, the, the, the hypothesis here from, from a lot of researchers in this field is that from an evolutionary point of view, if we're turning down those body systems, one of the ones that we don't really want to turn down too much is our muscle function. Because if we suffer performance-wise, at least in those early stages of low energy availability, that's going to impact on our ability to to get more food and and break that drought, that famine or uh, that lack of food intake. So our ability to hunt and gather diminishes if we don't have access to our ability to use our muscles to their full potential. So it's probably not surprising when we look at people in the early stages of low energy availability, when it's maybe not that severe or not for a very long period of time, that initially often performance is not negatively impacted. We, we still train well, we can still perform well, um, but we may start to see some of those other things creeping in around the edges, you know, for females, loss of menstrual cycle and, and things like that. So that adaptable low energy availability is generally would be considered sort of a temporary situation. It's not an ongoing thing. Uh, it can have positive benefits in terms of body composition for some people, you know, reducing body fat that might be helpful from a performance point of view if it's not too severe. Uh, it may have health benefits in terms of, you know, uh, lifestyle diseases, you know, chronic illness, you know, risk of diabetes and heart disease and things like that. For some people going into low energy availability might improve their risk profile for some of those things if they're at risk of diseases of overnutrition as well. And then there might be performance benefits that might be related to body composition or might be related to other factors as well in terms of increased training volume rather than just focusing on the calories inside. We can focus on the calories outside as well. So more training might mean more adaptation and, and better performance as a result. So there is a whole bunch of things and it, we can adapt to a period of low energy availability if it's not too long and it's not too severe. But obviously that is where we run into the issue of problematic low energy availability. And that is usually when that energy or lack of energy relative to our training load is going on for a really long period of time or is quite severe deficit. And so this is where we start to get sort of undesirable changes happening. So changes in our body systems that negatively impact on our performance and potentially our health as well. And that's what we would tend to think about in the context of what we call relative energy deficiency in sport or REDS. And I've just put up here the health consequences of that from that position paper I mentioned before from the IOC last year. There is another complete diagram like this around the performance aspect, but this is the health one in particular. And I guess the traditional factors that we've kind of identified here would be 
impaired reproductive function. So I've mentioned several times already, you know, females loss of menstrual cycle. For men, it can be lowered testosterone as well. And you can see that in male athletes. Impaired bone health because those hormones have knock-on effects to how we um, regulate our bone density. And so you can see impaired bone density. And I guess the worst case scenario there is increased risk of stress fractures in athletes. And you see that quite often in runners and triathletes, you know, anyone who's on their feet um, doing running or jumping type exercise, you've got an increased risk of stress fractures in that case. There's obviously a whole bunch of different ones here, and there have been a couple added to this diagram in last year's update to this compared to the uh, original diagram in 2014 and the, the 2018 update. I won't, I won't go through all of them now, but I guess just to say that there is certainly a, a bunch of sort of health consequences that are associated with that prolonged, um, prolonged problematic low energy availability, which is kind of the, the underlying cause of all of these issues here. Now, it's not to say, of course, that you can't have other reasons for these issues, other medical conditions and things that come along. And so we can't immediately jump to the conclusion, you know, if an athlete has one of these problems, it must be REDS and therefore a lack of energy availability, but it is certainly a possibility. And um, that's where you'd seek, you know, professional help in terms of medical care to kind of figure out what's going on there if you're not sure. Al, just before you jump off, um, I think if I'm if I'm correct, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the biggest change here was shifting from the center of the diagram, red S, and actually shifting in low energy availability is underpinning all that. Is that correct in my understanding of the diagram? Yeah, yeah. It, it's something that, to be honest, I hadn't even noticed until one of the authors of this diagram pointed it out to me um, when I was speaking to them about it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, originally the, the previous diagram from 2018 and then 2014 before that had reds in the middle. But of course, reds is kind of the the collective term for all the outcomes, not the cause. And yeah. so what the, what they did with this version of the diagram is put the low energy availability in the center of the diagram as the underlying cause of all of these things, uh, which, to be honest, I'd never looked closely enough to realize that it wasn't. I just assumed that low energy availability was in the center of it from the beginning. But when, when one of them told me it wasn't, I went back and checked the diagram and lo and behold, it wasn't. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, look, a small, small change to a very important diagram, but one that ultimately is so important for everyone to see, isn't it? That actually how energy availability can, in some cases, have a negative impact. And I guess, as you outlined with the adaptable versus the problematic, it's not always the case and there are other things, but yeah, that low energy availability can underpin everything, can't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is, which is super interesting. Cool, thank you. All right. Now, I mentioned before that there can be two causes of low energy availability in athletes, and particularly in sports like triathlon, distance running, cycling, where you know you, you, we're talking about big training volumes usually. So this can occur, that, that state of low energy availability can occur at, intentionally or unintentionally. So intentional low energy availability would be where an athlete has deliberately or consciously made a decision to restrict their calories relative to their training load. So this might be they start increasing their training volume. You know, they start doing an extra five hours a week of training and they make a conscious choice not to eat additional food to compensate for those extra five hours of training a week. On the flip side, it could be they've deliberately decided to eat less and maintain the same training volume or increase the training volume and eat less calories as well. Obviously, that's going to create an even bigger gap there and an even lower energy availability. So it, it's a conscious choice there. Often what you see in athletes, though, sometimes it is the intentional, but you can often see the unintentional as well. And I do see this quite a lot in athletes that I've worked with. And usually these are the ones who present with you know, often, you know, sometimes the stress fractures, but often things like just unexplained fatigue, like they're constantly tired, they're not performing in training, and they're not really sure why. And then when you start to get into things and have a look at it, you realize that they've got unintentional low energy availability. So this is where they haven't made a conscious choice to underfuel their training, but they just haven't realized how much they need to eat to meet their training needs. So maybe their training has ramped up, they've gone into a big block of training and they just haven't increased the amount of calories they're eating to compensate for that, either because they did try and increase it, but just not enough. 
uh, or they just didn't think that they needed to or didn't realize that they needed to. And, and often I do see that as athletes that just don't realize how much they need to to meet their training needs. Uh, and the other one might be for for some athletes, probably less common, but sometimes just, you know, changes in training habits. It might be changes in work routines and things like other things happening in your life as well. You start, you know, making changes to maybe the portion sizes of what you're eating or your food choices and things without realizing what effect it's having on your total calorie intake. And so you end up actually starting to eat less calories relative to your training um, for, for that reason. You've altered your, your dietary intake, but not through a, a conscious decision of, yeah, I want to lose weight and, and I'm going to do this, but just just changes that happen in your personal preferences or your life routines and things like that as they happen. Yeah, Al, on that, I think it is such common feedback that we get on the Fuel In program where athletes are like, oh, wow, I really, I realize now I was unintentionally under fueling mm -hmm. when they, I think when they see that sort of like, oh, I need to eat that much in order to fuel that volume of training. And as you say, it's not, it's not intentional. It's just, they don't necessarily understand the demands are always like what the demands are and as you highlighted, like with the physiological requirements and the essential requirements and then what that does in terms of energy demand. So it, yeah. is, it is something very common we do see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. One of the other questions that, that sometimes gets thrown around, you know, often when people get into this state of low energy availability, particularly on the unintentional side, might be because they're doing really big volumes of training. So this could be the pro athlete who's training 20 plus hours a week, but it can be even some of the top age group athletes that are training, you know, 15 plus hours a week, and they're just not eating enough for that. And so, you know, there's that, that term overtraining syndrome that's kind of thrown around. It's, you know, like, like anything that's called a syndrome, it probably means we don't fully understand the underlying causes and exactly, you know, how all those relationships play out at the biological level. And then we've got REDS, which is also kind of a syndrome of um, low energy availability leading to all these different kind of health outcomes as well. And so one of the questions that I guess has come up over the last probably five years or so is whether overtraining syndrome and, and underfueling or low energy availability are really two sides of the same coin, or are they two completely distinct things that can happen to athletes? And so there has been a bit of an attempt to look at that in the last few years, and so people have, you know, researchers have gone back and tried to look through the overtraining studies, which are probably the, you know, kind of older studies that have been published and some some more recent ones as well, uh, where people have described this kind of symptom of, of overtraining and, and gone back to look at the nutrition practices that have occurred in those studies. And not obviously not every overtraining study, we have information about people's nutrition. So we can't, you know, glean it from every study that's ever been done. But for the ones that we do have nutrition information about, the vast majority of them, I think it's more than 80% off the top of my head, would, you know, you would suspect that there's low energy availability going on there as well. So the question now is that if someone's running into those kind of classic overtraining syndrome, quote unquote, symptoms, is that because of just sim simply the amount of training they're doing, or is it because they could handle that training if they were fueling enough or eating enough calories to fuel that training. Would they prevent those kind of symptoms occurring? And I don't think we're there yet in terms of having a clear answer to that. But I guess what we do know is that probably under fueling is contributing to at least a reasonable portion of those cases where people have described overtraining syndrome and possibly if they were eating enough, they could avoid that. What we do know also from the evolutionary biology literature is that there probably is an upper limit to how many calories you can kind of eat, digest, and absorb in a day. And so to some extent, your gut is going to be the limiting factor to how many calories you can bring into the body. And so if you're training to a point where you're exceeding your ability to eat, digest, and absorb food in a day, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're going to come up against an upper limit, both practically and, and physiologically in terms of energy intake that's going to set you up for low energy availability if you're training to that extreme. But I would emphasize that that is very extreme. That's not kind of day-to-day -day training. That's probably more, you know, people running back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back ultramarathons or something like that for a, a prolonged period of time. So at the moment, the the guys in that kind of research field suggest that, you know, about two and a half to three times your metabolic rate is probably around the limit there in terms of a sustainable 
uh, calorie expenditure over a prolonged period of time that you could actually eat enough to get adequate energy availability to meet that need. And if you were trying to train to, to more than that, you're probably going to run into trouble that it's just not going to be sustainable over a long period of time. Al, can I ask you a question? Where do you sit on the overtraining, underfueling uh, sort of paradigm? Do you do you think overtraining syndrome exists, or do you think it is actually more along the lines of underfueling, given the science? Yeah, look, I, I think it's hard as a nutritionist or a dietitian to to give a fair answer to that. To be honest, because we are going to see predominantly the ones that do come in with the the underfueling. Like I can't think of examples where people have come in and said, oh, I've got a problem and I've looked back and gone, actually, you're eating enough. I just think you're training too much. Personally, yeah. I haven't seen that. But it's not to say it doesn't exist. And I think, you know, coaches would probably see that more than nutritionists or dietitians. So I think we probably get a little bit of a skewed view of that to be able to make a, I guess, an unbiased decision around it. So kind of sitting on the fence a little bit there. I suspect, you know, the majority of it probably is underfueling, but it's it's hard to say with absolute certainty. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. We probably are biased in what we see. Um, I guess what I, what I see is like when you look at the signs and symptoms of overtraining and then you look at the signs and symptoms of low energy availability, um, they're very similar. It's a lot and of overlap, so, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap. So... <laughs> Maybe it's a good, uh, maybe we can throw it out there on Instagram or something and ask, you know, do we, from the coach's perspective, does overtraining syndrome exist in there? And what are they seeing if, or their athletes who are suffering from overtraining syndrome, are they adequately fueled? And it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to get, as you say, interesting to get a different perspective from a different um, sort of profession. Mm. And, and I think even that's a hard question to answer because, as you said before, Scott, you know, a lot of people just simply don't know how much fuel they need, yeah. particularly when you start to get to those big training volumes where you, you know, you're talking about energy expenditures of four, four and a half, five thousand calories a day. Sometimes at the elite level, even more than that. Yeah, and and again, that's I guess what we're trying to do, isn't it? Trying to predict energy expenditure to allow the athlete to have some sort of inkling as to how much they're meant to eat and. Yeah, I think again, that's that's the work in progress, and that's what we're trying to achieve. So, mm. yep. yeah, it's For it's sure. fascinating. Yeah. All right. So the final thing I want to talk about was, I guess, this concept of energy availability across the season, and the fact that you know your training changes across the course of a season, and potentially your energy availability, whether it's intentional or unintentional, is going to change across the season as well. So the top half of the screen there, I've put probably kind of your your classic. Um, race preparation from a like a training cycle perspective for an Ironman. So I put in Ironman Texas here, which is happening towards the end of April of this year. And so again, this is not saying this is how you should train, just that this is kind of like your stereotypical organization of a training block leading into a race. So starting from sort of October of last year, there might be a base phase for, for several weeks. Um, where it's sort of all relatively low intensity, but maybe, you know, starting off from not much and then building the volume of that. There's that build phase where maybe you're adding a little bit more intensity in there, but really, you know, hitting hard on the volume. A peak phase where there's a lot more shorter but higher intensity type sessions, then a two-week taper uh, into your race, and then maybe a recovery period of, you know, a couple of weeks after that. And so obviously there's changes here in terms of the the hours that you're training or the distance that you're covering. There's changes in terms of the intensity of exercise as well. And so there's different permutations and combinations that are happening throughout all these different sections. And so that will change, obviously, the, the energy expenditure, the calorie expenditure across those different phases of training. And obviously it's not like it's all going to be the same through that. It's just, a, I guess, an overall view of that. So this is, again, not a prescriptive, this is how you should do it, but it's just an example of probably how people tend to kind of, um, how their energy availability tends to kind of wax and wane through that preparation phase. So maybe during that base phase, there's an element of uh, focus around body fat loss for some athletes. And so they may be in intentional lower energy availability. And then as they go into that build phase, they might focus a bit more on the training quality or they just find that they're struggling if they don't eat enough. And so they start eating more. And so they come back to something that more resembles adequate energy availability. 
by the end of that build phase, though, they may be in an, a state of unintentional low energy availability. I see this quite often at that stage of about you know ten to you know five to fifteen weeks out from a, a major race where people are losing weight without really trying to lose weight. It's not an intentional process. Um, it just sort of comes along for the ride, if you like. And so that suggests that they're in a lower energy availability because they're losing weight. Uh, not necessarily that it's problematic, but just that it's there. Uh, and then as they kind of get into that, the last part of the, the build phase and particularly into that taper, they may start to, well, and obviously their training volume reduces substantially. And so they sort of go back into adequate energy availability because it's very easy to meet their calorie needs. In some cases, people are actually conscious of not going into excessive energy availability and starting to regain body fat during that taper period as well. And then you've got that final couple of days before a race where you might be carb loading, and that that is a deliberate period of excess energy availability because you're trying to store all those carbs into the body for race day as well. So obviously your energy availability is going to change across different phases of your training and across the season. And I think we're not really at the stage yet where we can say this is the right way or the wrong way to do it. I think it's going to vary for different athletes. It will vary depending on how you like the style of training that you do and the different intensities of sessions. Uh, and it also depends on what your goals are, why you're training in the first place and, and where you're starting from, from a body composition point of view as well. So if you're a, a pretty experienced athlete and you know, you're trying to quote unquote sort of hit race weight and it might only be you know a few pounds or something like that, you know, that will probably come off whether it's unintentional or in, you know, you may have to be intentional for a short period of time during that build phase, but you probably don't need to worry too much about that in that base phase. Cause your, your baseline level of body composition is not far off where you're kind of your ideal or peak sort of competition body composition sits. Whereas for maybe more of a beginner or recreational athlete where, you know, they're taking up the sport for health reasons, um, and your body fat loss is part of that, then maybe that base phase is a period where a period of intentional lower energy availability, they can cope with a bit better when there's not much intensity in the training and the training's less likely to suffer as a result of that. Now, again, we don't want it to be too severe, that low energy availability. We don't want it to become problematic, clearly. We want it to be adaptive, low energy availability. Um, but that is a, a time where maybe that's easier to cope with, particularly for, for newer athletes into the sport. Um, so is there a time and a place for low energy availability across the season? Well, there might be times where it is beneficial. Again, we're talking about adaptive low energy availability here, not problematic. So uh, this might be body fat loss if someone's not already quite lean. And that might be desirable from a health point of view. It might be desirable from a, a weight or a, you know, a performance point of view as well. So this might be having short periods of a small energy deficit during training but you still periodize your carbohydrate to, to maximize the performance in those training sessions. And certainly that's uh, you know, how the fuel in app would work. If you uh, choose a, a goal weight that's below your current weight and that the system sets up a calorie deficit for you, it's still going to, I guess, promote or, or uh, identify those key training sessions in the week and stick the carbs around those to be supportive of those sessions. Now, the other time when you might be in a state of sort of adaptive but low energy availability it might be in an off season where you're kind of winging it you're not you know really having a huge amount of structure to either your training or nutrition and you don't have any specific training goals there now probably in most cases if anything people tend to go into a bit of excessive energy availability here and start to regain a little bit of weight but there might be times where you go away on holiday or something or you're doing a lot of walking or hiking or something like that in that kind of off season period where you know you do lose a bit of weight because you're you know, you don't have that same structure around your eating and th that can happen as well. I guess the times where low energy availability might be risky is prolonged periods of time in your training, particularly when you're doing high volume training blocks. It might be more that severe low energy availability. So really restricting your calories. So crash dieting, fad dieting, trying to have quick fixes for body composition changes, you know, trying to lose you know, 10 pounds in three weeks or something like that, that's certainly going to uh, potentially be a problem, particularly if it goes on for a longer period of time. Um, I think also at the height of your build and peak phase in your training, that's certainly probably a high risk time in terms of injury and illness because of the, the nature of the training there. And so that's probably a time where you want to be quite supportive from an energy availability standpoint. 
And then obviously during the the taper and and carbohydrate loading phase, you know, leading into a race. And I guess the question would be, well, why would you want to go into low energy availability in the week or two before a race? You know, sometimes there's that temptation. I think some people like, oh, I just want to lose that last couple of kilos before race day. But more often than not, it's probably going to compromise your preparation for race day. So yes, you might be a kilo or two lighter or a couple of pounds lighter, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll perform better and it certainly increases your risk of performing worse. All right, so that is it from me. Hopefully that gives people a bit more understanding, not just about what energy availability is, because I think you know we've talked about that quite a lot in, in various sessions. So hopefully people are familiar with that, but I guess how that might be beneficial or problematic at different times in the season and depending on how severe or not that deficit is and, and for how long your body's exposed to that period of, of energy deficit. Thanks, Al. Um, that was awesome. Uh, a question for you. Do we Are we clear on how long low energy availability can go for before it becomes problematic? No, not at all. Um, there's very little research on that. Um, and it depends on what you're looking for in that research as well. So it, the suggestion has been that it's different in males and females also, that females probably that energy availability becomes problematic more quickly than in males. Males maybe can uh, sustain a slightly more severe or prolonged period of low energy availability before you get into that problematic territory. Um, but yes, I would suspect it's going to be more than a few weeks but less than a few months, but we just don't know for sure. There's just not enough research out there. And, you know, putting people into low energy availability, one, is difficult, um, but two, it's yeah. ethically questionable in a lot of cases. So it's hard to do the kind of research studies necessary to answer those questions definitively. And what would be the mechanism why males maybe can cope with lower energy availability better than women? Has that question ever been answered? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, obviously, we're talking about different reproductive systems and then therefore different hormones involved as well. Um, that's probably, we suspect, the reason behind it, you know, the the impact of uh, lowered estrogen in females on, you know, bone density and, and other things as well uh, versus lowered testosterone. But, yeah, I don't think we really understand the underlying biology of it well enough to be able to kind of answer that easily. Yeah. It's uh, it is interesting the differences between obviously males and females and and how they uh, experience this. But I guess in in that, I guess the experience of low energy availability when it becomes problematic is quite similar for males and females. Would you agree? Obviously, apart from uh, you know the specifics of the reproductive system, but mm. in your experience, would you say that the signs and symptoms? from a subjective standpoint, are, are very similar from male, female? Do you see um, anything where females report specific signs or symptoms more than men and what, what those would be and like gender mm. specific? Yeah. Look, I think some of the more severe outcomes in terms of low bone density leading, you know, increased risk of stress fractures and things like that, you probably see a little bit more in females. I think for the males that I see present with low energy availability, it tends to be more on the performance and recovery side of things. So they're just, they're struggling performance wise and they don't know why um, they dig themselves in a hole. I mean, it can be stress fractures, but that's probably less common in, in the male athletes that I've worked with. Uh, that's been more, more so in the female athletes. So I think the male athletes, and this is just on my own personal experience, uh, I've probably presented more with the performance issues side of the coin female athletes has been probably more the health side of the coin, but sometimes the performance stuff as well, or or the two together. Um, I, I suspect that's also because in the males, athletes, things have to get a lot more severe before those health issues kind of play out. And so they're just presenting earlier in female athletes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and what about like, is there any relationship between say the ability to cope with racing in the heat and low energy availability or anything like that? Have you ever seen any research related to that? No, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I would suggest with severe low energy availability, you may see that play out in terms of gut function mm -hmm. and, you know, risk of, you know, heat illness related effects on the gut. Um, but other than that, and, and that's, that's speculation as well, but other than that, not that I'm aware of. 
myself. Would glycogen storage have an impact on heat tolerance at all? Uh, probably not specifically. I mean, when we store glycogen, we do store a little bit of water with that. Mm. So we'll increase our body water stores a little bit, you know, anywhere from sort of half a litre to maybe one, one and a half litre, something like that in that kind of range. But other than that, in terms of the, the, just the physical ability to cope with the heat, I, mean, I guess the only other thing would be we tend to be a bit more reliant on carbohydrate as a fuel source in hot weather. So more just, I guess, if we have less of that carbohydrate as a fuel source, we may sort of run into those kind of bunk, bonking or hunger flooding issues more quickly in the heat um, than we would in cooler weather. But it's not, I guess, coping with heat per se. Because am I correct, if a female has extremely low body fat, they have a reduced ability to store glycogen? Am I correct in thinking that? Did I read that somewhere? Uh, possibly. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure yeah, on that one. 100%. Yeah. I yeah. just I just wonder, like, when you see these extremes of uh, low body fat in females and then uh, whether that then has an, you know, we know that there are some negative connotations with that, but... Um, whether that can have performance impact as opposed to a performance benefit um, mm. going so low that it impacts other other aspects of physiology. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, something to dive into maybe at a later date. So um, I really liked your the timeline with the um, with the phases as well, and I think that was very good in that to give a very clear description and sort of overview to athletes where they they again unintentionally because of the in increase in intensity and they may just stay with their consistent feeding um they're not actually bumping up their their fueling in relation to the bump in training intensity and i thought that was really really great to just sort of visualize that and for athletes to gain an understanding so thank you yeah and i think that's where you, you know it kind of i'm not saying it happens to every athlete but it, i think it happens to a lot of athletes that, I think that it's period pretty and they common. notice they notice yeah it's pretty common and particularly for for long course triathlon or ultra distance running where their training volumes are so big and and so you see the weight loss and i guess it's just then whether that is sufficient enough for the low energy availability to become problematic or not and then play yeah. out in terms of the health and performance effects and you know often you do see it's it's the athletes that like everything's going well, everything's going well. And it's just at the end of that build phase or that peak phase, just before they're going to taper, that's when they fall in a heap and they get the illness or the stress fracture and things. And then, you know, obviously part of that is the training load, but part of that is possibly also that they're, they've now started to run into that problematic low energy availability as well. Yeah. And I, I can think of some specific cases with this where it's, and it's, I think it's human nature as the athlete, one of the athletes explained to me, they like, you get drawn into that, oh, I'm losing a little bit of weight, but I'm performing really well. Maybe if I continue losing a little bit of weight and it's, it's not intentional weight loss and it's not intentional under fueling, but the training's ramping up and they're losing a little bit. They get excited by that because the numbers are still good. And as you say, it then it's recognizing that and recognize it before it becomes a problem, which is... I guess the really tricky thing, because unless the athlete tells you as tells the training coach or the nutrition coach, it, it, you know, often just sort of flies under the radar, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess the other thing I didn't talk about is the fact that, you know, that problematic energy availability, how that plays out in terms of those health outcomes is different for the different outcomes. So things mm -hmm. like, you know, stress fracture risk in terms of low bone density. I mean, that's something that accumulates over months or years of having low energy availability. And so, you know, the more periods of that you have over successive years of training, that's going to kind of have an accumulative effect uh, in terms of, you know, bone density, whereas something like the illness is going to be more acute. It's something that can happen, you know, with only one bout of problematic low energy availability if it's yeah. severe enough, um, whereas you obviously bone density either improves if you're young enough or, you know, declines at an adequate rate as opposed to declining too quickly if you're in low energy availability. And that'll, yeah, as I said, play out over months or years, but then leading to that point where your bone's under the most stress because of training and then bang, off it goes. And then it's very difficult to come back from. Um, and, Correct. And we see, we see recurrent stress fractures over and over again once that bone density has gone down. And then it's it's that difficult conversation of when when does 
you know, the health have to become the priority over racing. And that's a, yep. that's a difficult conversation to have and not one that athletes like to hear or coaches, I think. And, but I think we, you know, you need to look at the bigger picture sometimes. Which is tough, but uh, yeah. Anyway, um, does anyone have any questions for Al? Um, I know I've had a few, but if anyone has any questions, please speak up. Uh, otherwise we can end it there and, uh, Say goodbye to everyone. So, do you mind if I pipe in there, Scott? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Alan, for that uh, presentation. It's, it's really interesting. Um, it's probably more like just contributing some thoughts as a coach by asking questions on the subject. Um, if, if that's okay with you, just to share yeah. my experiences. But um, first of all, before I say anything, I'd like to invoke what I call Dr. Allen's law or principle which i extracted from one of your articles in fueling so forgive me if i'm not paraphrasing you correctly but uh, we shouldn't underestimate or ever underestimate the importance and value of uh, anecdotal evidence not just yeah. scientific evidence and i think that's a, for coaches that's exceptionally important because we do a lot more observational um, data collecting than actually mm. studying research papers um, and with that said, I, I think the dimmer switch analogy that you used, um, I think is, is very, very important because at the end of the day, I think the body is an exceptionally intelligent piece of kit. And, and I think it behooves us as coaches, certainly as athletes to become very, very in tune with the, with the body to understand its signals. But what I'm getting at really is that the body really will be able to figure out based on the stimulus, the load that's imposed on it chronically or, or acutely will be able to figure out the optimal fuel combination to propel that body and to keep it to keep it going. And I think that's, that's very, very important to, to keep in mind. I, and I link this to uh, Scott's article um, with respect to um, Holly Loris's training over, over the winter time. Um, it talks about metabolic uh, flexibility and the fact that you can still increase your fat oxidation even with a good consumption of carbohydrates on a daily basis, as well as while you're fueling, whilst you're fueling. And I think that epitomizes how the body is so intelligent and can figure out the optimal fuel combination, which will be very individual, right? From athlete to athlete, um, male, female, um, within those paradigms. But I think that's that's really, really important to, to keep in mind. If the body is allowed to fuel or is being fueled properly and can adapt properly to all these stimulus, then the chance of getting into the LEA uh, are diminished considerably, I, I think, anyways. Uh, mm -hmm. With respect to the question of overtraining and underfueling, you know, the same coin, I think overtraining is much more complex. It involves you know, stresses outside of training. It can be, yes, we think of overtraining as doing too much training. There's a whole process of under recovering, and very much part of that is underfueling. And I think uh, the, the, the underfueling part definitely contributes to overtraining, but I don't think overtraining per se results in an LEA. It can, obviously, but I don't think it's a, like, a direct link. That's just my personal view. Um, one thing I find interesting in that chart, that circle um, that you present on reds, if you look at that, the arrows, the only one that has a double-headed arrow is the one with uh, referring to psychology, or I guess they call it mental health. But I think it's more psychology. And I think there's a huge, huge driver, LEA. And it's not just women. We tend to focus on the female athlete because of body image. But I can tell you my personal experience, I'm not embarrassed to say it, but when I was a young triathlete back in the day, I wanted to look like Mike Pig. I wanted to look like Dave Scott, Mark Allen, you know, you may be, you know, later on, even Jan Fugino, whatever. That's the image that we want. And we try to eat our way into that image, into mm -hmm. that performance ideal body. Um, but that is always going to backfire. And what I found, where I found success with my athletes, I don't talk about weight, don't talk about body composition as much as possible try to avoid it and just encourage it, eat to perform, eat for the performance of the day. If it's a recovery workout, then you eat accordingly. If it's a high intensity workout, you eat to, to perform. Uh, and so you maximize the benefits of the stimulus that are imposed and therefore you're gonna you're gonna progress. And what I have found a lot of athletes is that at first they're very worried, oh my God, I feel like a pudge, I'm eating like, eating like a horse. And then by the time they, they get to peak race preparation phase, they're still eating like a horse, but they're just like melting off the body fat, whatever. And the body transforms itself 
on its own because it just it's just so intelligent. It knows what it needs to do. So long as and I caveat this that you know you're fueling properly and of course you're recovering properly you know, and there's less stress in your life and all this good knowledge that surrounds every athlete. Uh, so that's kind of like the approach that I've taken to avoid LEA with my athletes. And sometimes I, I still find difficulty with some athletes, and that's why I put into train geeks, for example, or whatever platform somebody might use, is to give them a heads up because it's a big weekend of train. Remember to fuel, you know, I just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Just like the fuel and app will put in its its props. I do the same thing to help the athletes think ahead. Because quite often, as Scott pointed out, and he pointed out as well earlier, that you know, you train, you feel good, you feel svelte, and then all of a sudden, ah, I'm gonna skip that meal. I just I just want to maintain this body composition, this image that I have, and then boom, you have this acute LEA on the day of training because you haven't fueled in the days prior, even though you're fueling on the day. And I heard this from so many athletes, man, I don't understand what happened. I'm fueling, I, I took all the carbs I could take and everything, but I still bought. But you have to look at the bigger picture, as you said correctly, it's a, a longer term, bigger picture that needs to be costly, manicured, massaged, you know, manipulated, and uh, being attentive to, to make sure that we never at every stage of the game fall into an MEA state, which then could result in overtraining or, or anything else. And uh, I, I really applaud this whole fueling app and whatever else, and hoping that what, what, what my athletes that you, is using is going to benefit from it. Because at the end of the day, I really believe ultimately you got the fuel to perform, whatever that performance level might be. And I'll just end off with one little thing, if I may, is that the, the problem with intentional LEA, and I know a lot of German athletes used to do this, and I and I kind of copied this, and I, and I fell on my face many times as a young athlete, you know, is to, to go out there and try to ride like five hours just with two bottles of water because you're going to fat oxidize, fat, you're going to just maximize that fat oxidation. I personally think it's, it's it's a load of bollocks because at the end of the day, what ends up happening is that you downregulate your ability to use carbohydrates, which you want to use on race day. And then what ends up happening is people go into what I call, I've coined carbo doping, right? So they, they deprive us all this carbohydrates. Okay, I can do a five hour ride and two bottles of water. So I get to race day. Two cans of Red Bull, you know, and a bowl of pasta, and I'm gonna rocket fuel this this race. And instead, they have stomach problems, gut issues, and then they have the L the acute LEA right there at the most critical point in time, which is their A race. Yeah, it's my my two cents worth, but just want to kind of complement what you were saying from a coach's perspective and kind of throw my yeah. answer into that. Sorry if I took yeah, too long. no, 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 no. Thanks for that, Ed. And I think it's a really great point. Like on the body composition side of things, I totally agree. And yeah, particularly people who work with higher level athletes that are doing really big volumes of training. It's like, yeah, they'll say to you, if you want to look like a cyclist, go ride a bike for five years. Don't worry about the nutrition. Your body composition will take care of itself over that period of time. And, you know, if you do a lot of cycling, you'll end up converging on a body composition that looks like a cyclist or triathlete or runner, you know, whatever it is. Um, kind of regardless, as you said, of the the fueling side of things to, to a large extent. Uh, I guess it's different for maybe recreational athletes that are doing small volumes of training, maybe slightly different kettle of fish, but I totally agree with that. Um, you, you really see that that kind of play out. And obviously there's genetic element in that, like not everyone is going to look like a a pro cyclist, you know, Yo-Yo's know, finger guard or something like that. But, you know, you, you are going to start to converge towards that kind of type of body composition the more you do that type of training because it's just the adaptation to the stimulus that you're getting. So, yeah, totally agree with that. Yeah, if I mean, the other thing too is what's really, especially with triathlon, it's very dangerous is that still a lot of people don't see triathlon as one sport with three transportation modalities. They still look at it as a swim race followed by a bike race followed by a, a run race. And for the swimming, I don't think we tend to look at swimmers too much, except you know, we try to copy their drills for whatever reason. But for cyclists, you know, you look, they're all little ectomores, little T-Rexes on the upper body. So we try to you know, get ourselves nice and scrawny. So then we end up with D, vitamin D deficiencies and you know, those stress fractures let only hit the pavement. And then same thing with runners, they're a little ectomorph, so we try to eat our way to become a Kenyan, right? Which is completely inappropriate. Triathlete is a completely different species and needs to be, needs to have a little bit more robustness. And if I if I may, may, may say also on this, uh, Scott, I was watching uh, Holly Lawrence's um, recap of the T100 race with her husband, if you saw that YouTube video, and she looked fantastic. Like just had this healthy glow about her, right? I mean, she's just, cranked off a phenomenal race, you know, okay, she rested, refueled. But I, I think it's whatever you've done with her, like from a fueling standpoint, 
like just looks so healthy, performs and is healthy. And I think those two are the key to huge success. And I really believe that the health is the foundation. As, as unsexy as it sounds to coaches and, and to athletes or to athletes, I think that foundation of health supports everything that, that we do as athletes or our athletes do, I should say. I think it's absolutely key. Yeah, yeah. no, so, we're, we're big, yeah. we're big <laughs> believers. So, so. No, no, we're big believers in that. That, And we always say it, like a healthy athlete, a high-performing athlete. So, yeah, as you say, it's not always sexy, but it's, uh, I think when athletes buy into that, you tend to see the results. So, no, thanks, Ed. I appreciate that. Sandy, did you have anything? Did you have any questions? Yeah, Ed, for, Ed's for kind of hard to follow, but I'll I'll try to ask a question. <laughs> Go for it. Um, just, I like the the circle slide, Alan, and the mm -hmm. fact that LEA was LEA was in the middle of it. But I guess thinking about all the symptoms of all the different pies in the chart, um, is there actually a a test that's done to be diagnosed with LEA, or is it? more of a you're on a witch hunt because of all these different symptoms that could occur. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there are biomarkers that you can use for some of those outcomes. So obviously like yeah. in terms of reproductive function, you can look at reproductive hormones and things like that. In terms of bone density, you can go get a DEXA scan and look at someone's bone density, but you can't definitively say obviously that this has resulted because of low energy availability. It may have, it may be due to other kind of undiagnosed medical conditions or something like that as well. So, yeah. yeah so I, you, I remember Elizabeth saying that she had it and I was curious, how how do you determine that you have it versus, you know, 12 to 25 tests being taken? But you, you've answered, yeah. I was curious if the DEXA and the other things are enabling you to figure that out. Actually, yeah. Al, if I, if I ask that in a different way, is there a minimum criteria on that wheel to be diagnosed with red S. Is there like, is it two or more? Is that, I don't think there uh, even is that, is there? No, no. I mean, I think they're, they're kind of like possible outcomes yeah. rather than like, this is a clinically diagnosed condition and you have to meet X criteria and Y criteria and Z criteria mm. to, to sort of fall onto that spectrum. Uh, I, energy availability is a tricky one to measure, like the actual energy availability itself. Like the equation looks simple enough on paper, just, calorie intake minus the calorie cost of exercise and what's left over. Uh, as I said before, like we don't have any clear cut definitions of right. when is, when do you go from adequate to low? Um, when does it become problematic rather than adaptive? We, we don't have clear cutoffs for any of those things at this stage. We may in the future, but we don't at the moment. Um, I guess that in even that calculation of energy availability, you know, it, it's recognized yeah, in the research setting that that's, to get, I mean, to accurately estimate someone's calorie intake well enough to use in that kind of equation and get something meaningful out of it is very, very tricky. And the same with the exercise energy expenditure. I mean, if you were just doing cycling and you had a power meter and that kind of thing, maybe. Um, but once you start introducing running and particularly swimming, that's a really right. difficult one to estimate the calorie cost of with any kind of accuracy. Um, it, it becomes really challenging to the point where most practitioners and even researchers would say, like, like in research, they would try and measure that. But uh, in a lot of cases, they use more the biomarkers. They say, well, what's your reproductive hormones doing what's your your testosterone doing your, your estrogens that kind of thing right. is it affecting right. your your iron status is it affecting your metabolic rate can you see a reduction in metabolic rate those kind of markers but none of those are your definitive or cut off yes you have reds or no you don't okay thank you sandy you can stay tuned for an episode on uh fueling endurance alan's podcast that uh, exact, exactly what he just explained that uh, we're going to discuss the difficulties in estimating uh, caloric uh, expenditure and caloric intake. And so we'll give you a better insight into that. I think, um, and Sandy, just to your question about Elizabeth. So I guess what she experienced to be diagnosed with red S was, you know, stress fractures, loss of menstrual function, um, some mood disorders. So she had three clear patterns within that wheel that, you know, in, yeah, how many of them do you need to be diagnosed with that syndrome? She had yeah. a significant number of those signs and symptoms to then say, you know, okay, you seem to be experiencing signs and symptoms of red S. And so that's where that diagnosis comes from. Okay. Thank you. 
There is a tool um, that's published alongside that consensus called the REDS CAT. So that's the REDS Clinical Assessment Tool. So it's more designed for sports physicians in assessing uh, REDS and then I guess the what to do about it part of that as well. Um, so there is kind of a screening thing in there. Again, I don't think there's a, a clearly defined cutoff on any of this, um, but there is kind of a spectrum in there that you, so you can have a look, just Google Reds CAT, like C-A-T, uh, and you'll okay. find that in there. And it sort of gives a, like a brief description of, you know, when you've got adequate energy availability and it talks about Reds diagnosis. And it gives some idea of, you know, if you've got more than one of those factors going on. Uh, it talks about primary versus secondary factors. So we'll give you a little bit of information in there, but it's not going to be a clear cut, you know, you're on this side of the line or you're on that side. It's more a continuum of how severe it is. Right, right. All right, I'll take a peek. I think it's it's certainly an evolving space. And as Alan highlighted as well, Sandy, like the fact that the IOC did this update and it was a significant update in that, I think we'll see further updates and further adjustments or edits to the consensus statement around low energy availability and red s as more information and more research um, becomes available yeah and there is actually the one that you just posted ed i think is the original one there is actually a reds cat 2 that was published in october last year alongside the the updated consensus statement as well so yeah you can google like reds cat v2 i think and you'll find that okay Hey, I have a question, uh, Alan and uh, Scott. Thanks so much for hosting this uh, webinar. Um, have you found that there is, like, when women in particular are suffering from red S, um, that there is a macro that they should focus on, or is it just all overall calories? Hmm. Uh, I mean, technically, the energy availability is the overall calories. I, I guess the way I would probably approach that is is on a case by case basis and look at what what is the athlete doing now and and what would they benefit from more broadly, not just in terms of calorie intake, but yeah, you know, are they meeting their protein needs? If not, maybe I would probably start there. If they're really underfueling certain training sessions, maybe I would focus on that and getting a bit more carbohydrate in during okay. those training sessions. So, yeah, generally that's probably how I would do it, but it would be very much case by case basis mm -hmm. and just looking at, you know, how they're they're fueling and recovering, uh, nutrition wise, protein and carbohydrate in particular around training. If they're generally getting in enough protein and their carbohydrate is kind of matched up with their training and they're just not eating enough generally overall outside of training then it can be a bit of you know whatever is the most convenient for the athlete um, but i would generally fix up those things in terms of adequate protein and and you know periodizing your carbohydrate around training first because they are going to add calories as you add those back in and then if you've done all that and it's still not enough calories just because the training volume is so high you know you might need you know four and a half, five thousand calories a day or something like that for some athletes, then you know, it's just however you can get it in. Okay. Well, thanks. I would agree with exactly that. That would be my approach as well. Look at the protein, look at the carbs and and speak to the athlete about where they're potentially avoiding, you know, are you are you doing something intentional that is unintentionally affecting you? Which right. again, a lot of the time, again, and I'm I'm probably lumping this but with female athletes it often is an avoidance of carbs for whatever reason yeah, yeah. And so i think the carbs is tends to be the intentional like i'm intentionally avoiding carbs because i don't want to get fat um they unintentionally consume protein because they don't understand the importance of protein especially for an endurance athlete so mm -hmm. i think generally as as alan said you speak to the athlete you try and work out yeah. what it is that they're doing and then try and rectify it as quickly as possible yeah, I've been working with Elizabeth and she has been phenomenal on uh, oh, awesome. all of that, which is great. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a process. Like, oh, you know, yeah. As, well, as Alan even, said as well, it's a process. Yeah. Like, even you, on uh, Nick, with when you were talking to Nick Chase, how you were talking about Ari and saying, like, well, hey, with him, like, he just needs overall calories. Like, it doesn't matter where it's coming from at this point. Like, he burns so much that he just needs calories. It's not really the quality right now. It's more the quantity for him. And yeah, yeah that was interesting to hear too. 
Yeah, Al and I have talked about that a lot. And I think that's also like when athletes try and eat clean, that can yeah. become a real problem. Like I get it. Like there's that difference in type of athlete, as Al said, like, you know, there are athletes who get into the sport to improve health, to lose weight, to lose fat. And probably cleaning up their diet is a big component of improving their health. But at some point when you're a different form of athlete and you're trying to perform at your absolute best and your energy expenditure is so high right eating clean becomes the problem because there's just not enough calories in that right clean right. food so mm -hmm. yeah i think it's there's a lot of moving parts that have to be you know it's never a black and white scenario yeah well thanks thanks cool uh, nice. What was your name? Sorry, I don't know. Oh, I'm name. Colleen Baker. I'm part of the um the new like RTS. Oh, um, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've been super excited to join and uh be a part of it. My coach has been working with Elizabeth for about a year and she's like, Man, I really would love for you to work with Fuelin. And then this partnership happened and it's amazing. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. It's great. Oh, excellent. Really pleased to hear that. Thank you. Those got your heads expanding. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Uh, very good, guys. Uh, thanks, Al. I always, uh, I always learn a heap when I listen to you, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ed and everyone else for joining the call. Thank you so much. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Take care. All right. Thank you. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye.